Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the New Discourses Podcast. This is James Lindsay. I'm your host, and I'm going to walk you through the second installation, the second episode of this new series I'm doing here, which traces a single document, as I often do, uh, on what I'm calling the strange death of the university. So we're going to, we're tracking, if you forgot, from the previous episode of The Strange Death of the University, which was, uh, episode one was titled uh, The Red Thread, where it said the very opening of this document, as a matter of fact, was uh, that the that, that transformation is the red thread running through all of the sustainable development goals, and those do refer to the United Nations Agenda 2030 sustainable development goals. And that red thread of transformation is being applied very specifically in this document, which was put out by UNESCO, which is the United Nations Education, uh, Science, and Cultural Organization. Then the document is titled, Knowledge Driven Actions, Transforming Higher Education for Global Sustainability. And so what this uh, series is doing is reading through this document, the knowledge-driven actions, transforming higher education for global sustainability, remembering that the red thread that runs through of transformation is, or sorry, that transformation is the red thread, the, you know, communist red thread, obviously, that runs through all of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations and their sustainable development agenda for Agenda 2030. And the purpose of this document put out by a United Nations entity, UNESCO, their educational entity, is specifically to transform higher education into sustainable development goal cult activism think tanks. That's all it's for. That's what they think that all higher education institutions, not just colleges and universities, but whatever else is included in that, and they they, they do phrase it that way, universities and higher education institutions, whatever those all entail, all need to be retooled as soon as possible, urgently, in order to serve the sustainable development goals of the United Nations for Agenda 2030. Now, if you remember in the last episode, just to kind of frame what this means, and then we'll come back to the Strange Death of the University framing, um, and then we will read the first chapter, which is titled Introduction, to this uh, wonderful uh, document. But if you remember, um, the very first person invoked after the little foreword that mentions the red thread of transformation is Herbert Marcuse. I want to really strike that back into your head. Everything we've talked about here on the New Discourses podcast about Herbert Marcuse, everything that we've been uncovering in the past couple, I don't know, what, two years, couple of years, that we've been talking about Herbert Marcuse, repressive tolerance, essay and liberation, and in this case, One Dimensional Man, his 1964 blockbuster bestseller book, All of that is taken explicitly to be the framing in which this document is to be understood. If you had any wonder left, if the educational agenda, and if in particular the United Nations agenda, and in connection with it, with the Sustainable Development Goals, the World Economic Forum agenda, is Marcusean neo-Marxist, you need to wonder no further. They literally begin this document by saying, we need to go back and reread One Dimensional Man, because we haven't manifested its dreams yet. And educate in higher education in, in specific hasn't become the vision that Herbert Marcuse laid out, the neo-Marxist of the 60s, has that, that he laid out in his magnum opus, one might argue, One Dimensional Man. Maybe we'll have to go through One Dimensional Man in a series of podcasts at some point if we can stomach it. It's a very long book. It's almost 300 pages. So... I've said that this document marks a strange death for the university. It's very strange that the university has died, in fact, by being cordyceps. I don't know what the verb form of that is. I don't know if you know what a cordyceps mushroom is. But a cordyceps mushroom is a fungus. It's a mushroom. It really is a mushroom that infects insects or caterpillars or something like this. Ants, caterpillars, different kinds of insects. And it actually is one of those brain-controlling fungi. It gets into the brain and it transforms their behavior so that they will behave erratically and eventually somehow end up in the ground, at which point the mushroom will grow out of their bodies and then 
make its fruiting body spread spores. Those spores will get picked up by other insects that will then become zombies in service to the cordyceps mushroom and then self-sacrifice in one way or another in order to spread the mushroom. And what's happened is the university has allowed the its internal guidance to die. What the university is, what the idea, university is supposed to be, what the mission idea of the university ever could be or was, has been allowed to die a strange death and it has been replaced. It's been operating as this kind of woke zombie for a decade or more now. And at this point, the cordyceps is taking over, the fruiting body is coming out, and they're explicitly saying we're now going to align all higher education institutions with the 2030 agenda, Agenda 2030 they call it. So we're going to do that for the United Nations. These are all going to be think tank entities pushing the United Nations Sustainable Development Agenda. Every university has to get on board with it. And here's all this stuff. We're going to have academic freedom so long as it promotes sustainability. We're going to increase academic freedom as long as it promotes sustainability, which means, of course, no academic freedom at all. As they said, every university is going to have to in install not just DEI officers, diversity, equity, inclusion officers, maybe not even just ESG or environmental social governance officers, but also SDG, sustainable development goal officers or sustainability officers that are going to make sure that everything happening within the university frame or the higher education institution frame is set up in terms of servicing the sustainable development goals. Every class is going to teach this. Every subject is going to teach it. It's going to be embedded all throughout. There'll be officers to make sure that's happening, just like with diversity, equity, and inclusion already today. And in fact, they're going to mandate that universities are going to come up with a ranking system for universities for how compliant they are, et cetera. And then universities will be mandated to refuse to engage in research or support activities that support non-sustainable practices, and they specifically say that, and that it includes ex extra specifically the fossil fuel industry. So there's your engineered energy scarcity. The universities are going to have to toe the line and help out. This, if you are a university administrator or somebody connected to one, this is, this is the last station on the train, guys. This is the last station. If you don't get, it's like you're at the airport riding a little train, and this is the baggage claim. If you don't get off here, no one knows where the train goes after baggage claim. It probably goes into an incinerator, and that's what you're doing. This is the last station. I'm just kidding. Everybody knows how the train at the airport really works. It goes directly into a paper trailer. Um, this, though, really is. This document marks for the university system, for higher education institutions in general, whatever that refers to, colleges and universities, this is it. This is the last station. You get off the train now. You take a stand now. Or you've wrapped yourselves up in what's going to prove to be the greatest evil that's been perpetrated on humankind. That's your decision. No university, according to what it said in the previous episode we covered in the foreword and the, the executive summary, no university is going to be allowed to ex escape this. This is your last train station. This is the last last escape. If they retool your university for the SDGs and you go along with this, the university mission, in fact, it's said, if you recall, that the university mission is going to be replaced with the mission to satisfy the SDGs. At, the universities are going to have to rethink, critically reflect upon, and replace their existing missions with satisfying SDGs. That's what this document is about. This is the strange death of the university that was able to be killed from within. And if you recall, I framed this in the previous episode, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this in this episode because of that, but I reminded you that I did a podcast a while back, I don't know, a few, many months ago, probably the end of the year last year or early this year, where I started to read John Henry Newman's book, The Idea of a University. If you want to know how a university might die, it'd be good to understand what a university is and what John Henry Newman, who is a Catholic theologian, argued in terms of what a university is, is that it is, it's a place where all sciences are occurring. And what he argued is that a theology is a kind of science or a meta science that binds and orients all the other fields together and points them in a particular direction toward the highest conception of the good or the divine. So this is a theology. And he says that if you take the theology out of the university, what's going to happen is other departments are going to fill it in and they're going to do it badly. The social sciences department is not equipped to do this. The natural sciences department is not equipped to do this. What you, Whatever you want to think about theology in specific, I don't know how you put in a theology department because then it's going to be whose theology? Is it going to be Muslim theology? Is it going to be Catholic theology? Is it going to be Protestant theology? Is it going to be Lutheran? Is it going to be Presbyterian? I don't know how you settle those arguments. But what... 
John Henry Newman was saying is that if you don't have something filling that role, then what's going to happen is the university is going to be adrift. In fact, it won't be a university at all anymore. And other departments are going to try to fill that role. And then what happens, and this isn't what I wrote, this isn't Newman's argument, but what's happened is in that space of drift that a Trojan horse, cordyceps style, mushroom, parasitic, whatever you want to call it, viral religion, theology, the Marxist theology of pathos, dialectical leftism, we could give it a bunch of names, has crept in, and it is now explicitly binding and orienting all of the subjects in the university towards sustainability, which includes environmental sustainability, social justice as a form of social sustainability, and governance ordinances, and the 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations, which include really interesting and funny things like eradicating poverty in all of its forms in all places eradicating hunger in all of its forms in all places. These are very aspirational things, but according to what this said, it must not be allowed that they become aspirations. They are not to be aspirations or hopes. They are to be things that we are to devote all of our energies into creating in reality. What the 17 Sustainable Development Goals are is communism. If you read them for yourself, it's quite clear. So, In this episode of The Strange Death of the University, we're going to now explore this introductory chapter, which is broken into three major sections and then kind of a summary of the document. And these are, to to check through, the call, that's the first, the challenge, and uh, if it'll let me scroll down, I can read the third one, the opportunity, I think is what it is. Um, Yeah, the opportunity. So the call, the challenge, and the opportunity is how it's split up into these three kind of big categories. And it's a bit wonky, um, not wonky in that. Well, it is a little wonky in the technical sense, but it's it's wacky. It's strange. So the call is creating and applying knowledge for global sustainability. So knowledge has to be created and applied in order for what? For global sustainability. Now, the one big take home you should take from this series isn't just that the university is dying a strange death. It's that sustainability is a core word, if not the core word, I would add inclusion also, but that's part of sustainability. Sustainable and inclusive future, that's what the World Economic Forum always says, that's what the United Nations always says. But sustainability is a word for a cult religion. That's what it means, so creating and applying knowledge for global cult religion definition of sustainability. If, as I did in the previous episode, and I'll probably do throughout these episodes, if we replace the word sustainability with some religious word, it becomes very obvious that what we're talking about is a religious transformation of the university into this, uh, what I would say is the new version of the materialist spin on um, Marxist ideology. So I can explain that, but the call, creating and applying knowledge for global Christendom, global Islam, doesn't matter which one it is, creating and applying, the universities are to create and apply knowledge for creating global Christianity. It's very obvious at that point, when you realize that the word sustainability is a religious word, and that explanation was, if we go back to Hegel, you heard my Hegel podcast, you've heard some of the lectures I've given, I'm sure if you haven't, you should check them out, you won't know what I'm talking about. Hegel laid out a dialectical transformation map for reality. We're not going to go into whole details, but that it has three, there are three basic positions. It's a trinity that he lays out that there's a, uh, he was a speculative idealist. And so the idea, the ideal realm is where everything begins. And the idea gives rise to how we act in the real world. So we have our ideas about the world and we make them into reality. So the idea gives rise to the material, which he identified with the state the idea he identified with God, and then, or the Father and the Son, if you want. And then the material world that we actually live in creates a spirit of experience that we all live in. And that's the Geist, the spirit. And when he writes um, phenomenology of spirit or phenomen- phenomenology or however it's spelled in German, des Geistes, he's talking about that. Sp- what's the phenomenology that creates the spirit of the the era of the time of the of the place of the world and how does it evolve dialectically and so the dialectical 
engine is churning in the spirit, the contradictions of, of our experience or our idea versus what's really happening in the world churn around and the spirit becomes discontented and it overthrows and creates a new idea. And the new idea gives rise to a new material and the new material gives rise to a new spirit. And on and on the dialectic spins as a spiral toward the point where there's no difference between these things at any point anymore. They're all the same. The theoretical and practical have been reunited. So the idea and the, the state that it produces are contra free of contradictions, at which point the spirit that it produces is also free of contradictions. And you reach kind of like the trinity of God becoming one again, in some sense. Uh, Del Chardin, or what is it? De, Char De Chardin, is that right? Tailhard de Chardin, uh, called it the Omega Point, uh, the, the last point of history. I am the Alpha and the Omega, you know, the Omega Point, the last point in history is when the dialectical spiral hits that point. Okay, so in broad picture, so Marx picked, it, picked up this idea and he moved it, he moved his entire theory material. And what you can actually trace through the history is that the Marxist ideology or the Hegelian dialectical ideology, the dialectical leftist ideology, has actually moved in this way. And if you actually go back a step before Hegel to Rousseau, it actually also still fits. And here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. So we'll start with Hegel, and he's an idealist, and then Marx replaces him, and it's material. So the ideal moves into the material, the center, the location of the dialectical analysis moves from ideal to material, and then Marxism isn't working right, so where does it move next? To culture. To culture, and in fact, to the very fabric of the existing society. That's cultural Marxism followed by critical Marxism. Guess where that lives? That lives right there squarely in that spirit realm. And then if we wanted to go backwards, of course, Rousseau talking about the social contract and the spirit of the age and all of this is operating in the spirit realm that gives rise to the, the ideal realm of Hegel, that gives rise to the material realm of Marx, that gives rise to the, on a new, different level, the cr cultural and critical Marxism that's talking now about kind of the spirit, where the culture is playing out. What's the spirit of the world, the spirit of the times, how are things? That's where it's playing out. And then that gives rise as kind of critical Marxism starts to turn near the end. And then this new kind of woke Marxism takes up this whole quest with understanding knowledge in a new way, which is really what this document is about. We roll back into the ideal phase. It's idealist, but it's on a new level. That's what the way that the dialectical goes. Okay. And so there's these ideal genders, ideal, you know, notion of what race is or is not this, all of these identity politics get kind of conceived in terms of knowledges and they're out in the ideal realm and a, a, a culture is identifiable with its knowledges. That's a postmodern contribution that's moved it all back into the idealist realm. They would, of course, say that that's not what they've done. They would say that they've done something different, but that is actually what they've done. And then the sustainability call moves it back into the material realm. And what do we have here? Creating and applying knowledge, in other words, operating in the material, the, the, the ideal realm for global sustainability to move it into the material realm. And so sustainability is the new higher level understanding of materialist Marxism following out of not the old Marxism, but after it's gone through its cultural Marxist turn and its woke idealism again, and now it craps back out into a materialist realm, which is going to be global sustainability that's going to be enforced by public-private partnerships and all of this from the top down, enforcing behaviors and so on. And UNESCO using it to educate people into global sustainability, creating and applying knowledge. So that's a lot to unload in context, but it helps you understand. Now let's read this thing, which reads a bit like a fifth grader wrote it. I'm just kidding. It's not quite that bad. Humanity, they tell us, is facing unprecedented challenges. They, at the United Nations and at the World Economic Forum, and anybody who wants to freak you out, this is a persuasion technique. You talk about how scary everything is, you get people worried about it, and then you pretend to offer them a solution, and they're more likely to accept that solution. That's It's a simple technique of persuasion. Humanity is facing unprecedented challenges. Of course it is. We're in a new era. Nothing is actually being said there, but people are going to be able to tap into the idea, unprecedented challenges. So what? We solve challenges all the time. Literally, in some sense, all of the history of mankind is solving challenges. In fact, all of the history of life is solving challenges. Uh, how do I eat today? That's a challenge. Whoops, there's an earthquake and it separated us from this side of the valley to the other side. Things are different. Or we moved. We had to leave the coast and move into the plain. How do we eat? We're solving challenges, and it's an unprecedented challenge. We know how to live on the coast. We don't know how to live on the plane. This, isn't, this doesn't actually say anything, but it's going to put you in mind of things 
like climate change and these existential crises that we're going to need global cooperation to solve. Do you see what they're doing? Humanity is facing unprecedented challenges. So what? Most strikingly so in relation to climate change, that's a cult, and loss of nature and biodiversity, as well as inequality, which is at its lowest in like history, except economically because they robbed us with COVID, but that's beside the point, as well as inequality, health, which is at its was at its highest point until they started mucking around with things in the last five to ten years, the economy, same, and a whole suite of issues related to the 2030 agenda. Uh -huh, it has to be related to their agenda. These are not novel insights. In fact, they were expressed clearly as early as 1987 by the Brundtland Commission report. But despite warnings and increasing awareness, the, quote, business-as-usual trajectories have continued to dominate. Maybe because y'all are a cult and we didn't have to listen to your stupid crackpot plans. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, I know it's a little early back in 1987, but we weren't going to listen to a fucking autistic teenager telling us how to do our energy policy. Maybe we weren't going to listen to a global Black Lives Matter extortion racket telling us how to run our businesses and who is what we have to care about. Maybe back in 1987 we hadn't lost our friggin' minds yet. But despite warnings, how dare you? And increasing awareness among goofball activists, the business-as-usual trajectories have continued to dominate. Yeah, we're not going to upset the whole apple cart without really solid evidence, which it turns out there were good reasons to doubt. And the best reason to doubt it was that you weren't allowed to doubt it. If you tried to doubt it, you got shut down. You got cornered out. That's usually a symptom that you're up to something no good. But anyway, over the past few decades, there has been a growing consensus See, consensus is, is a social construct. It turns out that it is not truth. It's what a bunch of people believe. But uh, the, the postmodernists were actually pretty good at warning us about falling for the legitimation of consensus, or the legitimation by pyrology, John Francois Leotard called it. But I digress. Over the past few decades, there's been a growing consensus that we are heading toward an unsustainable and dangerous future. The ultimate risk is that we will reach regional and global tipping points in climate, biodiversity, and ecosystem services with the risk of, quote, untold sufferings for humankind. So this is your Club of Rome nonsense. A Club of Rome, if you don't know what it is, this is not a conspiracy theory. There was a meeting done in Rome in the uh, late 1960s and or 1970 thereabouts of a bunch of MIT scientists uh, and a strange Italian guy bankrolling all of this. And they uh, did a bunch of computer modeling to discuss the future challenges of the world, and they did their computer models on punch cards back in 1971 or thereabouts and concluded that the world was going to run out of its necessary resources at least by 2100, but maybe by as early as 2000. Turns out, wrong and so we have to start making massive changes, in particular limiting the population. In other words, it's just in order to stave off these global, regional and global tipping points in climate, biodiversity, and ecosystem services with a risk of untold sufferings for humankind. So it's this belief that the global ecosystem cannot support us and is going to break down. It's Mal Thomas Malthus's uh, philosophy, uh, he called it economics, uh, of, of calamity writ large and it why did anybody care what well why is it here well first of all they they write papers updating the book was called limits to growth it explicitly calls for limiting fertility controlling nitrogen fertilizers all these things that are very familiar today how in the world did that happen well academics about every th four, so many years i forget how many there are four or five iterations into this since then have decided to update the models and update limits to growth they haven't abandoned the theory they just keep updating it and saying that we're uh you know in a calamitous time al gore i think very famously had read this, these things and decided that he was going to do whatever it was with mother earth that he did back in the day when he did not become president um the world economic forum klaus schwab was inspired by the book Limits to Growth and brought the strange Italian bankroller that produced the book to the meeting of the European Management Forum, which became the World Economic Forum a few years later in 1973, the year after Limits to Growth was published. And we're just seeing this warmed over right now. What they go on to say is the increased risk of extreme climate events may also have cascading or domino effects on all the sustainable development goals. 
which is their object of their religious devotion or these sustainable development goals. Notice how what they care about is the increased risk of climate events might disrupt the sustainable development goals. Oh no, oh no, we might not get our religious devotion objects. The recent IPCC report from 2021 clearly expressed the seriousness of the situation and the urgent need for action. It would be great if we could trust entities like the IPCC. It would be great if we could trust these things, but it turns out that these goobers have been running things for too long and they're clearly running red threads of transformation around our world, inciting Herbert Marcuse, who is an outright known Marxist, so it's really not a good idea to trust the things that the people that are connected to them are producing. Maybe the IPCC report is correct. Maybe it's not correct. I sure as hell don't trust it because it's all connected in with all these lunatics who have undermined our trust in everything. As it turns out, left the left in general doesn't understand legitimate versus illegitimate hierarchy. In fact, they don't know why there should be hierarchies at all, which means that prior to that, they don't know how to tell when one is legitimate. Because they don't know how to tell if a hierarchy is legitimate or not, they only think in terms of hierarchies as manifestations of power, and thus they only think in terms about seizing power to control the hierarchies because they believe that they can make them all go away. Okay, And so the problem is, is that if you don't know the difference between a legitimate and illegitimate hierarchy, you don't know what makes a hierarchy legitimate or illegitimate. Like, I don't know, a hierarchy of, say, scientists or credible information or something like that. And so when these people take these institutions over, like academia, you can no longer trust their output at all because they don't know how to make a legitimate hierarchy. They do it on illegitimate grounds. And so we can't, they start working in activism, they start working in politics, they start working in agendas, they start working in prejudice and opinion into what would otherwise be rigorous science. They start stifling that which they don't want to hear. They start saying that we're going to have to suppress all research that doesn't support the sustainable development goals. And then you can't trust things like the IPCC report. You can't tell if it's they're captured, they're paid off. You can't tell what levels of corruption. So it's too bad that we can't trust those things. That's what these people are taking from us. Maybe this is a very serious issue. The problem isn't that we can say that it is or that it is not. I'm fairly well convinced it probably is not. But the reason I'm convinced that it's not is because these people lie to us all the damn time about everything that they can use to give us give themselves power. And this is one of those things. As a matter of fact, the climate issue gives them more power than anybody ever reckoned with because what it this is the key point of the climate thing it's not just that they can apply all these arbitrary standards of energy and food scarcity to control people which they can pretty much anytime anywhere they can control our movement they can control our travel they can control our ability to get together all in the name of low carbon footprints or net zero it's not just all of that it's that climate is truly global the climate is a global phenomenon right it's not like you just mess up the climate of, I don't know, Southern California. If there's pollution in the atmosphere, the cir that circulation's all through the globe. It changes the wind patterns as they, they, you know, all these things. And so pollution that's happening in LA can have a profound impact in somewhere like Hong Kong or something like that. And as a result, they can make global demands. They can force global cooperation under their control. They can force all kinds of global redistribution schemes. And they can get their globalist government that the communists have been after from the beginning. Communism doesn't work until it's global. And figuring out how to get to global communism has been the challenge for Marxists ever since Marx laid out his crap ideas. So we have to be extra skeptical of the climate thing because it's, you know, you've got all the motive, you have uh, you have the murder weapon, you have like all the pieces there that say we've got to take this with some serious skepticism. And they are not behaving around these ideas like they're using them responsibly. But I don't want this to take forever, so let's carry on. Given this new reality in which the future of humans, this new reality, remember when Herbert Marcuse said that there's going to be a new reality and a new rationality and a new sensibility? Well, this is going to be the new sensibility right here. Uh, sustainability, which is what I said. The new sensibility is going to be sustainability. Remember I did that podcast called Sustainability, the Tyranny of the 21st Century, and I said that the solution to the question of Marcuse's new sensibility from Essay on Liberation 1969 is that sustainability is the new uh, sensibility. It's a, it is, by the way, the sensibility that the Limits to Growth Club of Rome book actually says uh, it needs to be the way that we think about the world is sustainability. It comes up a bunch of times in that book. At any rate, given this new reality like Herbert Marcuse said, uh, in which the future of humans along with other species is at stake, 
it is time for universities and more broadly. So you scare them. Remember I said that a minute ago, you get them scared, you get them scared, and then you make them say, well, you have to do something. Not something has to be done. You have to do something. You have to recycle. You can't throw that away. You have to do this. You have to turn off your lights after 4 p.m. You have to turn down your air conditioner. You can't use too much water. It's something personal because when it's personal, it's a personal cost. When you make a personal cost, you commit to it because you experience cognitive dissonance and the resolution of that cognitive dissonance is most usually found in, I must support this more strongly than I thought I did that you don't necessarily consciously experience that, but that's how you resolve the dissonance. Why the hell am I the one turning my air conditioning to warmer right now? Why, why is it me? Why am I doing it? Well, I must care about this issue. That's why. That's the resolution to the dissonance that you're experiencing behind that question. And so they work up your emotions, they make you feel vulnerable, and then they tell you, you personally have to commit to a solution. And that's how they get you. I really mean it. That's how you do a cult. Uh, indoctrination. That's how you do a cult initiation, I should say. Given this new reality in which the future of humans, along with other species, is at stake, according to some models that may or may not be right, by the way, it is time for universities and, more broadly, higher education institutions to systematically rethink their role in society, their key missions, and how they could serve as catalysts for the necessarily fast transition towards sustainability that is required. The complexity of the challenges faced means that solutions should be a part of a radical agenda that calls for new alliances and new incentives. So let's talk about some incentives for a second. So here we're talking about a new reality in which the very future of humans along with other species is at stake. And it's framed in terms of climate effects. And climate effects are framed out as being, by the IPCC report, in terms of carbon dioxide rates in the atmosphere, levels in the atmosphere, which are at about 400 or some odd parts per million or something right now, which turns out to be like point, uh, what is it? I guess that's 0.0004% of the atmosphere or something like that. So, oh no, we're up at 400, um, parts per, per million. Uh, it does not, has not grown as fast as they predicted, but carbon dioxide is the problem. We have to get sustainable solutions. We have to get carbon dioxide in the atmosphere under control. So what could do that? Well, we need to stop burning fossil fuels. So we need to meet our energy needs somehow for both heating and cooling and all that. And then for, for transport and for the electrical grid, and we need to do that. And so but we can't burn fossil fuels. So what should we do? Should we turn on nuclear plants? No, we turn all those off. No. See, it's not about carbon at all. Because we're going to have to turn off all the nuclear plants, which are the obvious solution to bridge the gap. No, it's got to be windmills and solar, which have a host of problems associated with them, in particular that they don't work at scale because we can't store the energy at scale. That doesn't even touch the other issues. So the complexity of the challenges mean uh, challenges faced means that solutions should be part of a radical agenda that doesn't include the most obvious piece of the solution, but it calls instead for new alliances and new incentives. The universities have to systematically rethink their whole role in society. It's such an emergency, but we can't adopt the most obvious piece of the solution. If carbon dioxide is the main part of the problem, and a lack of energy is actually a form of inequality because guess who's going to get access to it? The people who can afford more of it when it's super expensive. That's exactly what's happening in Europe right now. Energy costs have skyrocketed. A bunch of people are saying they're going to have to close their businesses permanently. But guess who doesn't have to do that? Rich people. Google isn't going to have to close its business down in Europe. Any of these big industries aren't going to have to close their businesses down. They're going to pass those costs on to the consumer. It's only small businesses and everyday people that are going to suffer. And why? Because they turned off all their fucking nuclear power plants. Think about this for five seconds. If carbon dioxide is the main problem, the most obvious part of the solution is taken off the table. Something is fishy. So the increased risk of climate change events may blah, 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 domino effects. They don't care about that. And you can know they don't care about it because they're taking the most obvious part of the solution. I'm not saying it's a whole solution. The most obvious part of the solution is being removed right off the table. And instead they're saying everybody has to read. What did they say? Higher education institutions have to systematically rethink their role in society, their key missions. That's the death of the university. Your mission statements have to be replaced and how they could serve as catalysts for the necessarily fast transition towards sustainability, which 
for some weird reason, doesn't include the most obvious part of the puzzle, which would be nuclear power if this was really what it was about. It doesn't make sense, folks. It just doesn't make sense. Most of the sustainable development goals are directly or indirectly associated with the overarching and fundamental challenges caused by climate change, loss of nature and natural resources, health and poverty, and inequality. Now hold on again. Let me just think about this. So we know that these windmills are killing birds. We know that that's happening. We know that it does some weird thing about to the soil that kills off trees. We know that you have to clear the land of lots of wildlife and basically all of the trees and plants and nature in order to put a bunch of windmills. We know that you it's even worse for solar panels. We know that the solar panels leach all this stuff. We know that there's no way to store that stuff at, at, at scale. Okay, so there's lots of problems with those. We also know that nuclear doesn't have any of those problems. Literally none of them. Literally zero. All you have to do is make sure that, I get it, the Fukushima reactor was a scary thing. The only thing you have to do is when you build it, is you have to make sure that it's not going to, if something bad happens, that it's not going to land in the ocean. Okay. There are solutions to that problem. Like, okay, you can make solutions to that problem. So the, the most of the SDGs are directly or indirectly associated with the overarching and fundamental challenges raised, caused by climate change. Now, you see what I'm saying, by the way, if this was all supported by research done at a university, it would be non-sustainable stuff, and therefore you couldn't actually do this research to back up what I'm saying at the university um, after this goes in. Loss of nature and natural resources. Um, this... How much lithium do we need to run everybody having an electric car? That's a natural resource. It turns out to be a very limited natural resource. It turns out not to be located in some of the you know nicer places of the world with its major deposits. How many rare earth mineral, minerals are we talking about here to run an electric grid? How many chemicals are we going to dump into the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the environment with your toxic solar panels, especially these crappy ones made in China? Don't give me this. Don't give me this. You guys are not, the people that push this stuff are not serious about this problem. They're using it as a lever to gain power. Why? Because there's a red thread of transformation running through all of it. Hear what they are telling you. We have to rely on what Herbert Marcuse said to transform the universities because they haven't met that vision of a literal neo-Marxist yet. And therefore, they have to now systematically rethink their role in society, their key missions, and how they could serve as catalysts for the necessarily fast transition that's also described as a radical agenda towards sustainability, which they say is required, except none of the key pieces and a bunch of stuff that doesn't make sense are all at the center of it. Just think about it for like 10 minutes and realize that something doesn't add up here. Although these key issues have been identified, the 2019 Global Sustainable Development Report emphasizes that, quote, recent trends along several dimensions with cross-cutting impacts across the entire 2030 agenda, are not even moving in the right direction, end quote. Yeah, because they're stupid. Climate change not only implies... People are probably looking and like, why are we turning off nuclear power plants? None of this makes any sense. What, we're going to invest in a bunch of solar shit that doesn't work and it's covered in toxic chemicals and you have to like clear cut entire forests to put up some solar no and they only last how long well the chinese ones about five years and the really good ones maybe about 20 what do we do when they're done do we recycle them no one knows how to recycle them they're, what are they made out of toxic chemicals what do you do bury them why because of the environment stupid like there's a lot of people who looked at some of this stuff and are like uh this is legit r-worded we're not going to do that so it's, they're not even moving in the right direction in 2019. Better give them a pandemic. Climate change, they say, not only implies increased risk to nature and society in terms of gradual changes and extremes, in terms of heat waves, cold periods, drought, forest fires, flooding, as well as avalanches and rising sea levels. It also poses a major threat to human health, both directly and indirectly, via pests and diseases, political instability and migrations, and to food production, water security, and a raft of life-sustaining ecosystem services, according to the IPCC report of 2014 and the next one in 2021. Sounds serious. Where are the nuclear plants, you assholes? 
Loss of nature and diversity in terrestrial systems also affects a large range of critical ecosystem services. The word large wasn't there. I don't know how my brain said that. And represents a loss in its own right from an ethical and biocentric perspective, as opposed to an anthropocentric, people-centered these issues are highly intertwined. A loss of nature and a warmer and more acidic ocean has major implications for carbon sequestration and climate. Similarly, loss of biodiversity has consequences for food supply and well-being. Sounds like it's really important, and that's why you would have a bunch more nuclear plants, except no, you're turning them off. It doesn't add up, assholes. You're communists. You're, you're weaving a red thread for so-called sustainability that for some reason doesn't contain the most obvious piece of the puzzle. Hmm. Inequality, they tell us. Inequality. They love inequality. I remember, according to Klaus Schwab in The Great Narrative for a Better Future that he wrote this year also, this came out this year as well, according to him, um, that we have to, because inequality is so bad, we it, it's so dangerous and so bad, not to never mentions, by the way, that the greatest wealth transfer in history to the largest, most rich people in the whole world just happened under the auspices of COVID, which he saw as a narrow window of opportunity to ram a completely, uh, a complete transformation of the world's economic system that just so happens to be run by the same assholes who benefited from COVID. What a coincidence. He also says, though, that inequality is so bad, we have to rewrite our social contract entirely. Huh. How about that? How about that? We have to rewrite our entire social contract. And he says, why? Because the millennials and Gen Z demand it, because they are the broken generations that they intentionally broke. So they demand crap like this. I talked with a Gen Zer recently, and the Gen Zer was uh, formerly a leftist, is now asking some questions. I assume they're still very left. And we were talking about this, and they said, this Klaus Schwab guy is really freaking me out. Like, I can't find anything good about this guy. Like, I thought it was, like, there must be something, and I went looking, and I can't find anything good. This guy seems really shady, whatever. And we had this whole conversation, and he gets caught on the climate change point. He's like, yeah, but if we reject what they're pushing, does that mean we're just going to let any asshole that wants to put climate or to put carbon in, in the atmosphere as much as they want? And I said, let me just ask you. I shared this concern for many years, but I ask you, what are they doing with the nuclear power plants? And he's like, they're turning them off. And I said, does that make sense if they're really worried about carbon? And he said, no. And I said, uh-huh. But would manufactured energy scarcity be able to give them control? And he was like, yes. And then he's like, I'm even more skeptical of this guy now. You can care about the climate change. You can be worried about climate change. You can think climate change is real. But when you realize that the sustainable development goals don't make any fucking sense, if you think climate change is real, then you realize it's a power grab and you don't go in for it. But they're going to force all the higher education institutions to adopt this agenda. That's what this document is about. Remember, this document is not some crackpot. It's the United Nations. Inequality, however, is the reason we have to rewrite our social contracts entirely to be what? More socially just and inclusive. Mm-hmm. In other words, we have to adopt social justice ideology or DEI or identity Marxism or woke Marxism or whatever you want to call it to solve inequality. Like when they asked Ibram Kendi, a critical race theorist, how do we solve inequality? And he said, we make an anti-racist constitutional amendment that establishes, not in his words, my words, we could read his words, I've done it many times, that establishes the dictatorship of the diversity officers or the, of the anti-racist officers. Um, it would create a commission, a constitutional amendment to create a commission to a, a department of anti-racism in the federal government of the United States that has absolute authority over all local, uh, state, and federal public policies, as well as public officials, as well as private entities for when inequity surfaces or expressions of racist ideas comes out of their mouths and has punitive power to punish them until they voluntarily change, voluntarily change their uh, views. That's a dictatorship. That's a dictatorship of the anti-racist. That's the dictatorship of the proletariat remade into the dictatorship of the anti-racist. And we've read from Lenin on the podcast in the past where the dictatorship of the proletariat, the dictatorship of the proletariat offers the first real democratic socialism because it, as Lenin put it in state and society, uh, in the fifth chapter, he explicitly says that what, uh, what the dictatorship of the proletariat allows is that the people, in other words, the people who are in the party have democratic representation and the minority, which by which he explicitly says is the capitalists and the bourgeoisie and the kulaks and all the business owners who can't afford to run their businesses anymore because they're getting, de uh, 
deculacized, how do we say that, deculacization uh, of, of, of the small business owners because they can't turn on their electricity anymore because uh, they can't afford to run their business. Those people are going to be suppressed. That's what Lenin said. So we're going to make sure that the people, in other words, the party that represents the people, have a vote and that everybody who's against it is suppressed. And that's how the dictatorship of the proletariat or anti-racist is actually going to create the first simulation of true democracy, which is going to be called social democratic socialism that will eventually become true democracy when communism arrives. Okay, I got digressed here. Inequality and its consequences for poverty and hunger. That's how we're supposed to solve inequality, by the way, according to Kendi, is we're supposed to set up that commission to create the dictatorship that's going to give the anti-racists all the power and suppress all the people who are racist, which is everybody who isn't in agreement with or is against the anti-racists. Okay, in case you missed the point of how they're going to make our democracy more inclusive. Those are the words that they freaking use, but that's what they mean. They tell you. Read Kendi. It's one paragraph. It's in Politico magazine, 2019. How to fix inequality. Ibram X. Kendi. Look it up. Read it. It's one paragraph. It's a fucking dictatorship. Just like Lenin. There we're going to have our actual solution to inequality. So inequality is what we have to solve here. Inequality and its consequences for poverty and hunger are deep ethical problems per se, with strong implications for health issues that will worsen with a changed climate and degraded nature. Poverty also promotes loss of nature and diversity since scarce resources are overused. Moreover, inequality, poverty, and social injustice put basic human rights at risk and pose a threat to education, social welfare, trust, and stability. On top of these current and pressing practical and ethical challenges that we just made up, whoops, they didn't say that part, come the moral imperative to care for the well-being of future generations of humans. Which ones? The ones that aren't going to be born. No, they didn't say that either. And also the multitude of other life forms on the planet. This report is about the social, sorry, the sustainable development goals, however. So we were going to talk about inequality because that's really important. And that's what the universities have been doing now for like half a decade. This report is about the so sustainable development goals, however. So we're not really going to focus on that. It is important to realize that these will expire in 2030. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, that's only eight years from now. What are you going to do? We thus strongly recommend that higher education institutions, while being part a part of that agenda, should also look ahead. That's a nice, like that, that was the least smooth transition ever. And that per se, they had didn't make any sense. Why was it even there? Not only to implementing the sustainable development goals, but also to being actively involved in crafting what the next goals should be. Agenda 2050, of course. Time is a critical aspect here in two respects. <laughs> Where's Kamala Harris when you need her? Time is when you have a lot of time. And what you have is when you have time and you have time. And time is very strange when you have time uh, because time is passing, but time is also not passing, but it's passing from one to the other when it's passing in time. But anyway, sorry. Time is a critical aspect here in two respects. First, the time window to avoid critical climate change and damage to societies and ecosystems is indeed narrow. I know what to do. Teacher, teacher, what do we do? Turn off the fucking nuclear plants. God, it's so fake. I was really worried about this climate change shit for a long time, and these people completely lost me. Why? They're turning off nuclear plants. They don't make any fucking sense. They make no sense. Come on. It's the, the, we have a the time window to avoid critical climate change and damage to societies and ecosystems is narrow. So what are you going to do? Turn off the most obvious part of the solution and rely on windmills? I was hearing from some stuff in the travel industry that they're talking about getting big container ships and they don't want them to run on diesel because that would be no good and they can't let them run on nuclear because, oh my God. So what are they going to run these big giant container ships with? Fucking wind. They're going to put sails back on them. They're going to reinvent the sailboat, guys. The sailboat. Imagine one of those giant container ships with like giant parachutes caught in the wind in front of it, dragging it along. Mm, not kidding. That's the plan. Stop and ask yourself, does any of this make sense? Does any of this make sense at all? No. Secondly, the future time horizon should be widened and go way beyond 2030. Humankind has existed for some hundreds of thousands of years, and our goal should be both human well-being and a healthy planet for non-human life in the long term. We must stop discounting the value of the future. It is important for universities and higher education institutes more broadly. See, I don't know what the difference is. Universities, and I get that there's community colleges, 
and just col- colleges, and I guess maybe seminaries. What what else is included? Seminaries? Higher education institutions more broadly. I guess seminaries must be. Do trade schools count? What counts? It is important for universities and higher education institutions more broadly to retain their position as arenas for developing and debating critical ideas, except if they're non-sustainable. They just said that in the previous part. Basic research and education and freedom of thought, unless it's non-sustainable, like they said in the previous section. Okay. However, it is crucial. However, however, freedom of thought. However, it is crucial that they strengthen their role now as providers of knowledge and solutions in order to play a key role in this agenda. Once again, university people, let me tell you, you adopt a political agenda and the university is dead. You've let it die a strange death. Through exploring and explaining the risk uh, risks, plural, to societies in the natural environment, advising on remedies except for ones involving fossil fuels or nuclear power, and engaging in, it doesn't actually say that, by the way, I'm adding that, I ad-libbed, advising on remedies and engaging in societal transitions in technology, social norms, consumption, law, the economy, and distribution of goods, the economy like communism, distribution of goods like redistributing it under the name of equity, Roger, that counteract the risk of dangerous shifts in climate and ecosystems. There's a little bit of a non sequitur there. This calls for a radical new mode of inter- and transdisciplinary action in research and education, a matrix in which new horizontal structures and platforms add to the vertical, often silo-like structures of faculties and their departments. Now remember, inter- and transdisciplinary action, we're going to talk about that at the beginning of chapter two because they have a special box for it there in detail, and you're going to like, whoa, when you hear it. But in the short term, we remember what it said in the, the executive summary in the previous episode. What did inter- and transdisciplinary action in research and education means? It meant incorporating humanities and social sciences into all the other fields. In other words, putting the commissars in. Because you need, when you're working on, say, engineering to do with not nuclear, but any other kind of energy source, maybe making the, making the windmills work better, what you need is a friggin' English major. What you need is a person who's bringing in black traditional literature because of diversity in order to better understand how to make the fucking windmill work, how to build a battery that can actually store this stuff, how to build it without toxic chemicals that destroy the ecosystem, and maybe how to pr- protect the freaking eagles that it keeps knocking out of the sky like Trump said, but Trump can't be right. So they said that Trump was an idiot, but it turned out Trump was right yet again about the birds and the windmills. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. That's what inter- and transdisciplinary meant. It means bringing in humanities and social science scholars to oversee all the other disciplines to make sure they're focused on the sustainable development goals, which the sustainable development goals sound like those are massive geoengineering projects beyond the capacities of anything we've ever attempted before in the whole world. So that's why we need humanities scholars hopped up on critical theory to run them. It makes even less sense than turning off the nuclear plant plants, folks. It makes no freaking sense. What are these people doing? I know what they're doing. Communism, the red thread. Transformation is the red thread that runs through all of this garbage. That's what they said. First sentence of the document. It also calls for much more active outreach and community engagement because you are going to become the new cathedral universities of the sustainable religion. Do you not understand? Do you guys remember that short video that came out? You should look it up on YouTube and look up the water can religion. They made this video. I think the atheist movement made this video like in 2010 or eight or something a long time ago. And it has that, you know, it has a catchy song. It's a famous song. I, I don't know the name of the song, but it's a very catchy song. And it imagines that there is a, a global world religion based on the watering can, which is kind of a sustainable object, right? And so it shows like all these images, like the top of mosques, but instead of the crescent, it has the watering can. It shows, you know, Jews at the at the wall and they're carrying, you know, something instead of a Star of David or whatever that looks like a watering can. Or instead of the uh, menorah is a watering can and the Christians are wearing it around their neck. They've got it, you know, up on the wall in a church is a watering can. The, the idea is like, here's a stupid arbitrary religion based on a watering can and this is how religious people behave. Ha ha ha, aren't they dumb? But now sustainability is that thing. And if the frickin' watering can represented sustainability, we're living in that world. They're making the Jews, the rabbis, they're making the Muslims and the imams, they're making the Christians and the priests and the pastors do this. They're making them promote this religion. And now they're telling the universities that you're going to be the cathedrals of this religion, and you guys are going to have greater outreach and community engagement. Providing science advice, (laughs) the science advice, because nuclear power, never mind. 
for policy and extended networking and alliances. Remember they said that there will be no research that supports the fossil fuel industry or other non-sustainable practices. So science advice, as long as it doesn't advise something that they consider non-sustainable in the agenda that they're forcing you to take up. But that's academic freedom for you or something. While at the same time, approaching society with an open attitude and a willingness for dialogue. In other words, with activists. When the activists come, you have to listen. You have to dialogue. And when they make a demand that you change, you change. Because the activists are going to lead the thing. Duh. That's why you have to learn from your students more than you learn from, you know, getting your PhD and doing research your whole life. This report takes at its point of de- as its point of departure these new challenges to humankind and all forms of life on the planet, but not very seriously because we don't consider nuclear power. Whoops, that's not there. And the new role that higher education institutions need to assume for economic, societal, and environmental transformation, but not nuclear power. It also adopts human rights-based, a human rights-based approach as its frame of reference. This means that it firmly takes the position that all human beings, merely by virtue of existing, deserve equal respect for their basic human rights as spelled out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 1948, as well as in the second and third generation of human rights instruments on social, political, economic, and cultural rights. It argues for the acknowledgement and appreciation of cultural diversity. Why? And considers that the consensus of the... uh, The consensus. The consensus. And considers that the consensus of 193 of the world's countries, according to the United Nations in 2015, around the 2030 agenda of the United Nations supports a more equal distribution of general well-being in the world, as well as the achievement of what is needed to ensure a sustainable future for life on the planet. So it takes into into account the fact that we have to listen to the United Nations. Oh, okay. Because a lot of people have been convinced to do that so far. Maybe the United States should pull out of the United Nations. What would happen then? Let's just pull one country. So maybe it's just 192 countries agree. How about now? How's it going? It believes that the sustainable development goals define some of the most important purposes to be achieved in order to fulfill this consensus. By the way, if the United States pulled out of the United Nations, I'm just going to mention Trump was right again. You can work out what that means for yourself. The institutions and organizations of nations and societies are called upon to work toward these goals. Those are sustainable de- sustainable development goals. Higher education institutes and institutions in general are key to our progress toward them. See, they're key. I told you last time, they keep giving you signals as to how fragile their agenda is. Higher education institutions in general are key to our progress toward the sustainable development goals. In fact, previously, they said basically all the universities were. What if all the universities in Texas said, you know what, we're not doing this? What if the state of Texas or the state of Oklahoma, which these are huge oil states, maybe the state of Alaska, maybe the state of West Virginia. There's Alaska, so Alaska's oil, um, West Virginia's coal. What if these states, Pennsylvania has a lot of coal, what if these states that really kind of depend on the fossil fuel industries in major ways, North Dakota, South Dakota, parts of California, as a matter of fact, what if they just said, you know what, we're not doing this. We're not doing this. We're just not going to do this. Well, they said that higher education institutions in general are key to our progress toward the sustainable development goals. So if you get some universities at, say, the level of the size of a state, say just Texas, Texas and Oklahoma, something like that, they got a big stake in this, right? These particular things. What if they just pulled out and said, you know what? We're not doing this anymore. We're not going to transform into a sustainable UN agenda with our universities. We're going to serve the the uh, people of Texas. We're going to serve the people of Oklahoma. We're going to put Oklahoma issues and values and Texas issues and values first. We're not going to put United Nation issues and values first. We're not going to reorient our universities to be in line with the sustainable development goals of the Agenda 2030. What if that happened? Well, that's key to their progress toward achieving these goals. They could fall apart. It doesn't take that much to actually interrupt their entire program. It's much more fragile than we think. We think, and therefore we go along with, oh, well, if somebody doesn't go along, it'd be really bad. Well, if a lot of people just decide we're not going to go along with this, their whole thing falls apart very quickly. It's key to making it happen. Section 1.2, the challenge, informing the 2030 agenda. The main argument of this document is about the importance of universities and higher education institutions in global progress towards the sustainable development goals. If they do not embrace the 2030 agenda, it will be difficult, even impossible to achieve. It's what I just said. Just get 
some states in the United States of America that are maybe big fossil fuel states are going to get screwed over by this bigly to decide it's not in their state's best interest to retool their entire university systems to align with the freaking United Nations agenda and pull out of it. Prohibit it at the state level. Say, no, you're not going to do this. You may not align your university with the, they're going to say academic freedom, academic freedom. And you're going to say, you're not going to make these commitments. You're not going to hire these officers. You're not going to be able to do this. What would happen? It will be difficult, even impossible to achieve the 2030 agenda. Let me introduce to y'all the 2029 project, which is called stopping the 2030 agenda at least one year ahead of time. That's the 2029 project. That's my project. If they do not embrace, if the colleges and universities, if higher education institutions, hey, seminaries, why don't you bulk on this? Keep the role of faith out. If they do not embrace the 2030 agenda, it will be difficult, even impossible to achieve. Mm -hmm. They're giving you the roadmap. It's not even hard. Just say, no, we're not going to actually retool and become United Nations think tanks for SDGs. We're going to do our own thing. We're going to educate people. We're not going to become think tanks for the SDGs. It will be difficult, even impossible to achieve the agenda. How about that? Their role is key for several reasons, for several reasons that are elaborated in this report. Higher education institutions have accumulated knowledge and research procedures that can both explain and contribute to solving the main ecological, economic, and social problems that face societies both locally and globally, like nuclear power. Well, it doesn't say that. The academic freedom they profess and defend <laughs> is a problem because it would no notice that nuclear power is a good idea. The academic freedom they profess and defend, as well as their normative structure and ethical principles, have allowed most higher education institutions to be oriented toward an understanding of our world's problems, and in many cases toward possible solutions to some of them. Remember, the point of, of, of learning, though, isn't to understand the world, it is to change it. Transformation is the red thread running through all of the sustainable development goals. Higher education institutions have drawn on this knowledge produced globally to design their educational programs. So you owe the global system, the global community, to design their educational programs and are training new generations of professionals with knowledge, skills, and ethical principles that it is hoped will guide their professional decisions and actions. As aspirational free institutions, higher education institutions in general are particularly open to novel and critical thinking. Open your minds. Just let your brain fall out. Open them wider and therefore also represent unique intellectual spaces for rethinking sustainable development. The sustainable develop, like maybe adding nuclear power to it, you assholes. The sustainable development goals prioritize the problems the world faces at the global level, in a fake way, uh, in order to ensure a dignified future for life on the planet, according to how they define dignified, which is going to be in two classes, <laughs> theirs and yours. They also represent a global agreement. Better remind people, lots of people already signed up for this. They also represent a global agreement by 193 countries on the roadmap for working toward desired outcomes through targeted goals. They say that over and over and over again because they're desperate to look like it's the only thing that's possible because lots of people agree. It's legitimation by paralogy. Postmodernists warned us about this. Embracing the 2030 agenda does not in general challenge universities and higher education institutions academic freedom. It does not do that in general. It only does it in specific. Remember in the previous part, they explicitly said that we will not allow edu higher education institutions must refuse to engage in any research that's not for sustainable practices, Expe especially the fossil fuel industry, Texas, Oklahoma, West Virginia, Alaska, North Dakota. Are you listening? Pennsylvania, Kentucky, are you listening? Louisiana, Louisiana. Come on. How did I forget Louisiana? Are you listening? Central California. Are you listening? Are you listening? If it's not on the contrary, precisely be Sorry. Let's do the part again. Embracing the 2030 agenda does not in general challenge universities and higher education institutions, academic freedom. On the contrary, precisely because of their academic freedom, most universities and many other HEIs, uh, higher education institutions, are in a privileged position to propose and provide bold and novel contributions to the SDGs. They're just not allowed to do things that are non-sustainable, like support the fossil fuel industry. They're just not allowed to do things that aren't allowed. 
And by the way, if your higher education institute is a seminary, you're going to get that commandment to be stewards of the earth in terms of fulfilling the sustainable development goals. So your religion, whatever you want to say that that verse is about, is going to be co-opted to this religion, the sustainability religion, with a watering can in front of, uh, at the top of the at the front of the church on the wall in place of the cross because you don't need a cross anymore because you have sustainability. Their decisions on academic programs and research activities must remain their own unless they are against sustainable stuff. They actually said that already. I'm not going to leave that alone. However, oh, there it is. Their decisions on academic programs and research activities must remain their own. However, in the light, in the light of what has been said and in line with the ethical principles of universities and higher education institutions, the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs should become important priorities and be given more weight within these institutions. Universities and more broadly higher education institutions should prioritize those SDGs to which they are best able to contribute. Ah, you just have to reprioritize. So you can be as free as you want. You can do whatever academic stuff you want as long as you prioritize the SDGs. And by the way, and by the way, you're not going to be allowed to do any research that supports non-sustainable practices. Just saying. They already said that. Universities, they tell us, have played an increasingly important role throughout their long history. For example, the University of Bologna, Paris, Oxford, and Cambridge, dating back to 1088 1150, 1167, and 1209, respectively. Starting out as elite institutions, which I think were theological in their orientation, like John Henry Newman said, starting out as elite institutions before transforming into mass institutions in recent decades that no longer have theology at their heart and are now adopting a new one. Their role in the Enlightenment Humanism and prosperity of societies. Humanism, by the way, is one of the names for the religion of Marxism. And the prosperity of societies is of immense importance, and as such, they have changed societies for the better, citing Steven Pinker. The flip side of this is that higher education institutions have also contributed to some of the problems that now require Sustainable Development Goal 2030 action. Against that background, the premise of this report is that higher education institutions in general are uniquely well-positioned to take action towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. You really should be thinking of this not just as a religious document, but also as a religious eulogy for the universities that they're basically laying to, to rest. Universities have developed and evolved into a broad spectrum of higher education institutions over the past decades, and in very recent years, some of them have become more instrumentalized. Financing from governments and sometimes, uh, sorry, financing from governments sometimes guides higher education institutions' projects and developments, and the business sector has an interest in placing resources primarily in activities with economic potential. This context requires the whole higher education institution sector to reflect, reflect how critically, to reflect critically upon its wider role in societies, especially in the light of the multiple sustainable development goal challenges. Let's just bring up the SDGs one more time because you have to invoke Jesus. Have you ever read like a, a article or like a tract, a paper like this about religion? Like, especially in the light of the multiple challenges to instituting, to evangelizing Christianity, especially in light of the multiple reasons we're going to talk about Jesus again in this sentence. It's, this is a religious document for a cult, the sustainability cult. 1.2.1, higher education institutions and the SDGs. The sustainable development goals are without a doubt ambitious. No, they're crackpot actually, but at any rate. One might even say utopian. Oh, yeah, they said it too. The sustain. Let me just say that again. And then, then there's a but. And just wait till you hear what's after this. This is just. This is art. This is Marxist comedy. The sustainable development goals are without a doubt ambitious. One might even say utopian. But they are both diverse and plural. Diverse and plural makes up for the fact that they're crackpot. No problem. Sure, they're not real. Sure, they're impossible. Sure, they're utopian, but they're diverse and plural. Okay. The diversity of goals, metrics, and targets catalyzes. Everything catalyzes. Why? Because catalyzing means changes, transforms, enables a transformation. The diversity of goals, metrics, and targets catalyzes, because this is alchemy, and articulates different kinds of knowledge. Hmm. How different kinds of knowledge. However, there are also strong forces and structural configurations that oppose sustainability. Doesn't that sound Marxist? 
Hmm. Short-term outlooks on the part of governments, enterprises, and even individuals who see their interests challenged by moving toward these goals. Oh, it is Marxist. Visibly Marxist. This call, I'm telling you, sustainability is the new materialist turn of the leftist dialectic. Of the from Marx's sorry from Rousseau's cultural thing or societal thing to Hegel's idealism to Marx's materialism to the cultural and critical yeah cultural and critical Marxists culturalism to the woke idealism again now back to the sustainable materialism round and round the dialectic it goes and our new sustainability I'm sorry our new sensibility in the sustainability agenda is given here. It's very, very clear that this is Marxist. This calls, this is so you have a call made for, in response, for a strong stand on the part of higher education institutions regarding the need for Jesus development, I mean sustainable development. Every single time I'm telling you, it is seriously a religious document. Get it in your head. There are substantiated criticisms that the 2030 agenda with the 17 sustainable development goals represents an imposition that is based on a fragmented view of the world. Uh, yes. However, the deterioration of the quality of life of the majority of the world's population due to inequality and poverty, as well as the depredation of the environment and the resulting climate change, have led to the identification of points of no return if humankind does not change its patterns of production and consumption. Citation, Nature 2021. So they cite something out of nature. So I looked up the citation, Nature 2021. Do you know what it is? It is a one and a half page opinion piece that says that a document like this should come into existence. So that's a fake citation. That's a totally fake citation. So there's, there's a lot of criticism of our stuff. However, cite an article that happened to be published in Nature calling for a document like this to be produced. This has nothing but some opinion about sustainability. It's literally an article about the need to implement the sustainable development goals. That's but it doesn't say really why. It's a page and a half. It's no, there are no details. There's no data. There's nothing really there. And then there's a call to make a report of this kind. How about that? That's bullshit. That's glaring bullshit. Chase down one reference and it's glaring bullshit. What a surprise. The 2030 agenda calls for, quote, leaving no one behind. Except the deplorables, and we could name some other people. How you doing, German business owners that are going to have to shut your businesses down because there's no electricity you can afford? How are you doing, Californians, in the same situation? How are you doing, British people who are being told that you're going to have a really cold winter? How are we all doing that no one's being left behind? How are you doing, uh, Ukrainian people? Hmm. <sighs> The 2030 agenda calls for leaving no one behind, like Sri Lanka, which has no food, and the role of higher inst higher education institutions in key is key. I'm sorry, in proposing and testing social policies and strategies for inclusion in all areas, such as health. You mean like medical lysenkoism? You mean like woke medicine? You mean like focusing on diversity and inclusion in medicine, employment, and poverty reduction? Is that like where they're talking about controlling inflation by getting a, unemployment back up to 10%? Is that what they mean? Because that's like the plan right now. And particularly in the area of education, hmm, hmm, to which these institutions belong. Yeah, education, which has become Freirean, which is Marxist thought reform. Okay. Sustainable development goal number four seeks to ensure that by 2030, there is inclusive and equitable quality education. Inclusive and equitable equality is an oxymoron against those words, and that lifelong learning opportunities are promoted for all. Again, I mentioned this in the previous episode, just like H.G. Wells said in The Shape of Things to Come, lifelong learning. You don't grow up ever. You're constantly in a state of becoming because it's a Marxist religion, a dialectical religion, a lifelong learner. Elitism in the higher education institutions can be partly attributed to the unequal distribution of quality elementary and secondary education. See, so we're going to have to remake all of those programs. By the way, I just learned today in conversation about this document that the K-12 through education already has massive initiatives to reshape education in terms of, guess what? Did you guess the sustainable development goals? Ah, uh, yes, of course. But elitism in the higher education institutions is partially attributed to because the, to the unfair and unjust, unequal distribution of quality elementary and secondary education. 
This is something that must be combated with determination from many angles. So all you private schools, you're going to have to get in line, buddy. <laughs> but higher education institutions should play a key role in educational inclusion at all levels. The 2030 Agenda is a call to all sectors of society worldwide. Now, it's speaking of diversity and inclusion and higher education and all this, so that means that Harvard's going to keep not including Asian kids, right? They're going to keep like keeping them out because they're like not socially mobile enough or something. They don't have good enough networks for the Harvard hedge fund. Is that what that means? Because that's what they're doing. The 2030 agenda is a call. See, it's more sustainable to keep the Asians that work really hard and are really smart out, apparently. But you let in the ones that are CCP operatives kids because of the Asia Society and the Confucian Institute or something. The 2030 agenda is a call to all sectors of society worldwide. Hmm, that sounds big. Higher education institutions have a particularly important role to play in progress toward the sustainable development goals. As plural institutions, they have built a reservoir of knowledge on each of the sustainable development goals that both theoretically and technically underpin proposals for the advancement of each of the goals. They also have the ability to convene different sectors of society to debate and define the ways ahead with long-term perspectives. They are not generally dependent on short-term returns, thus allowing for new ways of handling the problem of discounting that is devaluing the future versus the present. They are prestigious institutions, not for long. By the way, academics, listen, buddy, this is the last stop on the train ride. You will not be prestigious institutions. You're going to become UN think tank for the agenda. That's all you're, you're, you're going to throw your credibility in the trash anywhere in the world that there is still freedom. Nobody will respect you. And then nobody will send their kids to you. And nobody, the, the whole thing will grind to a pathetic whimpering halt. Or the regime is going to take over. We're going to live in this communist hellhole they're describing that they're trying to implement. And you guys are going to get to pretend to be important because you're going to be the fake thing that credentials people to participate in the new fake world that they're building, the new hyper real thing. But you're going to get replaced with the metaverse anyway. Why go to Harvard when you can go to Harvard digitally? Why go to Harvard when you go, how, at all? Like you could go to the Roman Coliseum and I just saw an ad in my Instagram. I'm scrolling through and it's like in the metaverse, it was an ad for meta. These students are actually in the Roman d d debate forum watching Marcus Aurelius or something have a debate. Why go to Harvard at all? You don't have to go. Harvard doesn't need to exist. Harvard is just this algorithm running in the metaverse. Mm. Keep going, guys. Whatever. They are prestigious institutions that have the trust of their constituency, which is why when I talk to people that are doing hiring in various sectors of the economy around the country right now, they tell me that when they get... Uh, applications, they actually evaluate people who don't have a college degree first because they know that people with a college degree are an increased liability. And if they have an Ivy League degree, they're an even bigger liability. You can't ride on fake legitimacy for very long. People figure it out. So they won't be prestigious institutions that have the trust of their constituency. You're burning, they're burning through the trust so fast. Universities, listen to me. If you do this, if you become mouthpieces for the United Nations Sustainable Development Agenda 2030, what is going to happen to you is you are not going to keep the trust of your constituency. You might have that forced upon the population that we have to play by your stupid game. You will not have the trust of your constituency. You have already lost most of it in this country. You're going to lose so much more so fast. Every place I go, everywhere I go in this country all across the 50 U.S. United States. To be fair, I've only been to 40 of them, but that's pretty good. That's kind of a lot of them. I hear people say, I don't want to send my kids to college anymore. I don't think we should go to college anymore. I don't think college is the way. I think college is a scam. This is happening everywhere. I go to colleges and universities and I talk to faculty members and they think, I think they say things like, I think higher education isn't going to survive. I don't think this is going to exist in five years. And the reason is because your prestigious institutions are losing the trust of their constituency. You are assigning on for political agendas that are stupid and communist, and all that does is burn down your trust. All it does is burn down your resources. Stop it. But well, let's read. They are prestigious institutions that have the trust of their constituency and can foster that by proposing ever more robust solutions 
to social demands. Actually, the majority of Americans right now want you guys to shut the hell up. No one wants to hear from an academic. Nobody trusts a study. Nobody trusts anything. You know what you guys did with your schools of public health, which speaking of CCP, the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, which is owned by Ronnie Chan or paid for by Ronnie Chan, who's connected to the CCP. How about that? Right. You know, they had good COVID policy or they had some COVID policy, whatever. It's some Chinese something. I don't know. I digress. Finally, they have the power to train new professionals with a different outlook on the future of the planet and their role in achieving it. So you can just rewrite the social contract. You can break another generation. You can brainwash our kids into hating us or whatever it happens to be, whatever Klaus says. It is not possible for uh, higher education institutions to opt out of this key role. See, it is not possible for you to do that. It is within their power and their responsibility to strengthen their contribution to building more equitable, just, and sustainable societies. Or, you know, you could just fucking teach people. You could actually just do basic research. You know, you could actually do that. It's not possible for you to opt out of your key role. It's, however, within your power to become mouthpieces for the regime. That's what they're telling you. The 2030 agenda can become the beacon for unifying strategic planning toward this goal. No, it can't. I'm telling you once again. I am once again telling you, you will destroy your university. I am once again telling you, do not do this. Maybe if I say it in a bad Bernie accent, then you'll freaking believe it because you only listen to progressives. I don't know. Section 1.3. The opportunity. Higher education leadership for the 2030 agenda and beyond. Are you getting the theme that the 2030 agenda is all they give a crap about? If higher education institutions are to make their potential contribution to the 2030 agenda and to the social development, uh, sorry, sustainable development goals, explicit priorities in their future work, we see advantages in reflecting as higher education institution communities. Mm -hmm, watch that community thing. You're not communities. Make your freaking institution work and make it do what it's supposed to do. Reflect on its real mission as opposed to re re reorganizing and adopting a new mission that kills your university. We see advantages in reflecting as HEI communities on the need for HEIs to change certain key elements in their principles. HEI is higher education institution. I'm getting sick of having to read it. To change certain key elements in their, in their principles, procedures, and organization change certain key elements in their principles, procedures, and organization in order to facilitate their contribution to a sustainable and equitable world, world order. No, just world. Just kidding. These changes are outlined below. 1.3.1, answering the call, our responsibility as higher education institutions. Higher education institutions have ethical principles. The call is not so much to change them as to make them explicit ensure the community is aware of them, and, uh, sorry, that teaching and research activities spell out the way these values are put into practice, and that universities and higher education institutions have mechanisms to ensure and evaluate all university and higher education activities for consistency and congruence with them. So you don't have to change your principles, they just have to be the sustainable development goals, and then they have to be put into everything, blown out into the community, and you have to have accountability measures put in place to make sure you're doing it. Emphasis should be placed on the ethical values inherent in sustainability. See, you don't have to change. The call is not so much to change your ethical principles as to make them explicit, right? Emphasis should be placed on the ethical values inherent in sustainability. Oh, but what if they aren't that? Well, then you do have to change them, don't you? These involve stressing the value of all forms of life. They also involve visualizing the future and the people and species that will inhabit our planet for many generations to come. Notice nuclear power didn't show up anywhere in this. Of necessity, values must embrace more reasonable and sustainable ways of life, like freezing to death because your windmills don't work, and the need for transforming the way we produce, consume, and utilize our waste. Valuing life involves valuing the quality of life, and this means standing up for minimum welfare standards for all. Oh, we're going to value life, and that means you have to advocate for welfare. And therefore, for equitable, it says distribution, but redistribution of opportunities, goods, and services. In other words, socialism. Valuing life involves socialism. That's what they said. They didn't use the S word, but they described it. Valuing sustainable ways of living, it's socialism. 
so we don't get lost, will also require networking and alliances with others in society striving for the same objectives. So you have to facilitate building out the communist network. Got you. These others include all those who combat depredation and build solutions to problems that may be local but affect us all. Traditional societies and ethnic minorities and other groups subject to discrimination on prohibited grounds such as gender, disabilities, etc. should be included among these allies. Comrades, I mean, it says allies, but we know. A strong stand on values related to sustainability demands that the voice of universities and higher education institutions be heard in society, that clear recommendations derived from research be made known to policymakers, so you're going to be lobbyists, by the way, and the advocacy activities be included as part of universities and higher education institutions outreach. In some cases, the strong stand on sustainability values may involve universities. Remember, you didn't have to change your values. You just have to take a strong stand on sustainability as your values. Um, you don't have to change them. You just have to have a strong stand on sustainability values, which may involve universities and higher education institutions and interventions at the local level in order, among other things, to demonstrate the efficacy of new approaches and solutions, as well as to impact local realities. So there'll be a new sensibility with a new rationality to create a new reality. And the new sensibility is sustainability, and you're going to have to model it for people. 1.3.2, educating the centennial generation. Education is a key role in most higher education institutions and contributing to the 2030 agenda and beyond higher education institutions have to consider the fact that problems related to sustainability and social justice are complex and require an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach. We'll come back to that in chapter two. Since no discipline on its own is able to comprehend this complexity, still less contribute to solving these complex problems. Let's pause about this complexity thing. You know who invokes complexity? People who want to be in charge. What is a woman? I don't know. It's too complex. I need an expert. What does it mean to be straight? I don't know. It's too complex. I need an expert. People who invoke complexity like this are saying, don't worry, you stupid plebs. We'll handle it. Give us the power. We'll find the answers. It's complex. You don't understand. Leave it to the smart people like us. Sustainability and social justice are complex. They require interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approaches, which means we're going to add humanities scholars to solve these problems. You stupid engineers, you don't have a single humanities scholar turning your work into communism. You're never going to figure it out. No discipline on its own is able to comprehend this complexity, so we'll have to bind the disciplines together and orient them towards sustainability, just like John Henry Newman said that you would bind them together and orient them toward good or God in a theology. Same. This means that educational programs should be designed with an approach that transcends the discipline, see it binds and orients them, and trains students to work together with persons with different expertise, like humanities majors. In line with, so Judith Butler has to step into your engineering department and tell you what to do. There you go. In line with what has been said about making ethical, they were going to queer every field. We're going to bring queer theory into early childhood development psychology. We're going to bring it into education. We already did bring it into education. We have Drag Queen Story Hour. We're going to bring it into everything. We're going to queer engineering. We're going to queer chemistry. There's already super queer chemistry. That's already a big thing. We're going to queer medicine. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Find you an older doctor and hope you live uh, less time than them. That's all I can tell you right now. In line with what has been said about making ethical principles explicit in every higher education institution activity, educational programs should include ethics training for future professionals and all the HEI's stated values. Guess what they're going to do? Including those related to fostering Jesus, I mean, sustainable lifestyles and training advocates for sustainability and equity. This pro So you're going to have to put your freaking more training for future professionals, more training in sustainability, more seminars, more workshops, more DEI, more blah, 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 more ESG, more SDGs. This process should be explicit. See, you're going to have to go to fucking training seminars should be, and should be discussed, critiqued, and prefer preferably endorsed by the students because you couldn't possibly say no to the people who have you financially by the balls, could you? The aim of training, stu training students as citizens with global and local responsibility, aka activists, should be shared by faculty and students alike. Subject areas related to the 2030 agenda, such as intercultural... See, if the students are going to lead it, do you know how easy it is to send somebody to college and now they're a student? So any activist organization could whip up some activists, they could get some Antifa or some shit, send them to college, enroll them into your college, and now you have to listen to them. 
You see it, how easy that is. It's not people who've been there for 30 years or 20 years who have the best, lots of experience. Nope, got it. It's going to be led by the students. But you can just bust students in pretty literally. How about that? Subject areas related to the 2030 agenda, such as intercultural understanding, gender equality, human rights, social justice, and of course sustainability, notice nuclear power didn't make the list, should be transversal across the different transversal across the different educational programs and made, gotta scroll, and made explicit in their educational objectives. Academics and the HEI teachers, higher education institute teachers, should be made aware of the importance of these subject areas and where necessary trained, more trainings, everybody, to incorporate them in the syllabus of their courses. The Soviet, the council, needs to train you guys, okay? More trainings, more trainings for everybody, more trainings and tomorrow approves. Awareness of ecological and social problems, as well as the development of social and civic responsibility and the adoption of values and principles. Wait a minute. So you have to adopt certain values and principles with certain spiritual awareness, I mean, ecological and social problems, as well as the development of duties of conscience, social and civic responsibilities. That's a religion by First Amendment definitions. Are best achieved when students directly engage with such issues in their studies and focus on contemporary societal challenges and social transformation through inter- and transdisciplinary projects carried out at the local level. Make sure Judith Butler shows up to your ecology project. In many parts of the world, higher education institutions are selective and exclusive. Uh Uh-oh as they leave out entire sectors of the local and national population, you know, like Asians. Wait, no. Due to both academic and economic conditions. Oh, so so like Asians. Oh, no. Often impacting disadvantaged groups, like Asians? No. For example, by ability, ethnicity. Oh, like Asians? No. Or gender. Men? No. However, diversity of outlook with students that reflect the diversity of country or region in which the institution is situated, strengthens and enriches dialogue, debate, and the search for solutions to common problems. So you got to have diversity to get the benefits of diversity. That was what um, the Backey versus the Board of Regents of uh, University of California said in the 70s and was reaffirmed and strengthened by the uh, University of Michigan case, which was Gritter versus Bollinger in 2003. And so they changed the logic of why we need diversity, because apparently it enriches shit, um, which I don't think this is the way they mean it. Um, It is a challenge, they say, to be able to represent the different uh, sectors of society within each of our institutions. However, doing so has critical implications. I bet it does for the ability to generate solutions to societal problems within higher education settings. So you got to bring in activists because they have to have the the authentic expression of what it means to be a diverse person, right? Remember, diversity means that you have the authentic understanding. Black people have been structurally determined to be black. Farm boys have been structurally determined to be white or farm boys or whatever. Women have been structurally determined to be oppressed by men and the patriarchy and misogyny, and they have to bring that authentic activist position to college or else they're not bringing true diversity. Diversity is defined in terms of having critical consciousness, which is the real apprehension of the true concrete realities of one's existence. Okay, so we know how the trick works. So they have to re-emphasize diversity. Gotcha. Okay. So because of sustainability, because, you know, the windmills aren't going to do it all by themselves. The importance of strengthening the relationship between research and education is therefore an issue that becomes particularly important in working toward the 2030 agenda of communism. It doesn't say that part. The centennial generation now enrolled in higher education institutions. So I guess below um, Gen Z, we now have centennials. We had millennials and now we have centennials. That's a downgrade. Um, Sorry, guys. But the the people now enrolled in college seem to be increasingly aware of sustainability issues and concerned about the future due to the very direct impact of these on their life prospects. Well, they've been brainwashed to believe that by these idiots, but anyway. Universities, and more broadly, higher education institutions should take their concerns and motivations seriously. This No, you should actually be responsible adults, but you all forgot that. You actually all forgot that. This is one reason, though not the only one, to open up multiple opportunities for student participation in decision-making and in all types of initiatives. Remember what I said before about you can literally bus in students? But anyway, and foster the ability of students to make their own decisions and design their own extracurricular activities 
within the clear framework of the values set out by their higher education institutions, which of course are sustainability and achieving the sustainable development goals. I added that last part. 1.3.3, centering knowledge on sustainability, inclusion, and equity. Centering knowledge on sustainability, inclusion, and equity. Let it sink in a second. Just let those words sink in. Centering knowledge on sustainability, inclusion, and equity. It's the last station, guys. The last train station before the cliff. Get off the train. Higher education institutions should update and deepen their reflection on the ethical question of how the application of knowledge, while bringing immense benefits to some, has sometimes harmed human and non-human life. For example, fossil fuel-driven energy production, the fusion of the atom, the development of pesticides and a number of agricultural practices, the production of toxic waste, and the destruction of cultural diversity through education have produced negative outcomes. The fusion of the atom. I assume they mean the fission of the atom, but the fusion of the atom follows, I suppose. They might be talking about hydrogen bombs, which have never been used in war whatsoever. Fission bombs were used in war, but they, they don't have the nuclear straight. See, they're so serious about nuclear that they don't even know which nuclear they mean. The fusion of the atom, if harnessed, would actually be a real gener general, uh, genuine revolution in energy production. The fission of the atom is something that would allow us to have a sustainable carbon lowered or even maybe neutral future, even carbon negative if we built enough of the things. But they said the fusion of the atom. See, fo these are all the bad things. Fossil fuel driven energy production, the fusion of the atom, they have to mean the fission. They don't even know what the fuck they're talking about. The development of pesticides. Okay, <laughs> here comes a famine. Remember those locusts? No, you don't, because they're pesticides. And a number of agricultural practices, like nitrogen fertilizer probably. The production of toxic waste and the destruction of cultural diversity through education. The destruction of cultural diversity through education, no more superstitions, that's bad, that have all produced negative outcomes. There are many, that's Paulo Freire's point, by the way. There are many others that are not as visible but subtly present in our training and research programs. There is a clear need to question the efficacy of the knowledge produced and its application to the solution of problems affecting our societies and our planet today, such as the one covered, ones covered in the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. We cannot stress enough the importance of progressing as humankind toward each of these goals. Oh yeah, we get it. It's your religion. However, in many cases, it is not higher education institutions that are addressing these problems. It is mainly commercial pharmaceutical companies that have developed vaccines against COVID-19 to give one example. What a great example that was. What a great example that is. Knowledge building in many areas, especially those that have commercial possibilities, is being transferred from higher education institutes to profits to profit-oriented global enterprises that are not guided by ethical frameworks but motivated by profit. How about that? Good thing we have Larry Fink to put them back on ethical... Pr oh, geez. Gosh. Conflicts of interest and all kinds of criminal and cartel behavior. At the same time, there are extremely few knowledge management policies able to restrain unethical and dangerous uses and applications of the knowledge produced. It is not superfluous to mention the fact that some higher education institutions, as well as some individual researchers working in them, have been instrumental in some of these activities because funding for research is often available from these sources. Okay, so unethical and dangerous uses, application of knowledge produced. What are they talking about? Are they talking about feminist glaciology, which got like hundreds of thousands of dollars of National Science Foundation money? No, I don't think they are. There are many interests behind knowledge building processes, so much so that knowledge is often seen and treated as a commodity. Ooh, sounds like a Marxist analysis is coming. Knowledge is seen and treated as a commodity. Huh, sounds like Paulo Freire has been here. Instead of democratizing knowledge, which should be a common good, like on Wikipedia, like the activists write Wikipedia to make sure that it smears the people they don't like and bet benefits of people they do like, and they change the entry for cultural Marxism to cultural Marxism conspiracy theory so that they can say that anybody who engages in talking about the phenomenon of cultural Marxism or its derivatives is an alt-right conspiracy theorist. Roger. It should democratize knowledge, which should be a common good. Democratizing. Remember what democratizing means under Lenin? Again, society, uh, the state and society, or society and state. I gotta remember which way it goes. Anyway, you remember what he said? 
that we only have fake democracy until we institute the dictatorship, and we institute the communist dictatorship, socialist dictatorship of the proletariat, then we can approximate real democracy in the way that we achieve it, he said, is by elevating the voices that represent the people and suppressing everybody else's. Sounds like how they run Wikipedia. That's democratizing knowledge. It means elevating their voices and suppressing dissidents. That's what it means. we got to suppress mis- and disinformation, right? No misinformation, no disinformation. We have to democratize knowledge, and our democracy is a threat by facts. Instead of democratizing knowledge, which should be a common good, it is being privatized. This phenomenon calls for a rethinking of the protection of rights. That sounds great. The regulation of the applications of knowledge. The regulation of the applications of knowledge. Nothing going against SDGs. Don't go against them. And the need to foster progress toward an open science policy. One area in which higher education institutions are generally, in general, I'm sorry, are particularly called on to demonstrate the social robustness and impact of their activities is education. Higher education institutions are part of national education systems and they belong to the world or the sphere of education. The sphere of education? The fuck is that? That's made up. Is that the eighth or the ninth sphere of hermetic transcendence? Like, which one is it? The sphere of education? They belong to the world? Or the sphere of education? They have to deal with the consequences of good or poor quality education at lower levels. Well, that's true. Uh, Maybe you should stop ruining education then. They also face the effects of selectivity of candidates due to dropout rates at lower levels of education. They should take a special interest in influencing policy and practice regarding the inclusion, quality, and equity in the entire educational system, starting from early childhood education. Oh, this is a call for the higher education institutions to become levers to make sure the agenda gets pressed down into the K-12, through maybe pre-K-12. through Gotcha. Many higher education institutions are involved in initial teacher education, and this is particularly privileged, a particularly privileged space for influencing practice toward inclusion and quality at the lower levels of education. See, you guys control the colleges of education, so make sure that sustainable development goal crap gets into them. That's the point. Sustainable development goal four on quality education includes the opening of opportunities for lifelong learning for all, just like um just like Wells, Orson Welles said in Shape of Things to Come, which requires the strengthening of equity and inclusion at the higher education level, as highlighted in the SDG Education 2030 Steering Committee's report on making higher education more inclusive. That's a 2020 report. This role of higher education institutions in general is traditionally carried out through adult education, but a review of these activities is needed to also include education for sustainable development. Mm Mm-hmm. An analysis of the diversity of those benefiting from lifelong learning activities is necessary. In short, the potential contributions of higher education institutions to uh, Sustainable Development Goal 4 should be high on the list of priorities. 1.3.4 Democratic Management and Student Participation The changes to be brought about in higher education institutions in order to contribute to the 2030 agenda and have an impact on the future of the planet and humanity have to be shared by their communities in line with Sustainable Development Goal Sustainable Development Goal 16, which refers to building, quote, effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions, and particularly to target 16.7 that calls for ensuring, quote, responsive, inclusive, participatory, and representative decision-making at all levels, end quote. This sounds an awful lot like communism. This calls on higher education institutions to strengthen their management systems in order to uh, socialize their purposes and listen to uh, proposals for change from different sectors of society, like stakeholders probably. Faculty is of course key in this process, but so are educational administrators and personnel in general. Students too play a key role as youth are very much aware of sustainability issues that affect their future. Again, Think of how easy it is to just bring in activists and make them into students, and now you have to listen to them. They are primed for consciousness, or being reborn in a religion of sustainability, maybe. They are primed for consciousness and willing to take committed action if they feel it will alleviate their already central concerns. So you see, you whip them up, you make them think there's an existential crisis, like Greta Thunberg said, and then you you, you set them loose, and now they're going to 
be easily radicalized, that's consciousness, and be willing to take committed action. In other words, they're going to be activists. And so that we should take them more seriously because they're young and idealistic and impressionable and uh, easy to get hopped up and misled. Gotcha. Networks, alliances, advocacy, research, and intervention projects are natural ways in which students express their desire for a different world because they know so much about what that should look like, right? Not this, mom. And an excellent, productive, informative way of channeling their nonconformity. Nonconformity in the kids? Are you shitting me? They are the most conformist clowns ever now. They're so scared of getting canceled that nobody steps an inch out of line, or if they step out of line, they step all the way out of line the other way. That's such crap. That's such crap. They're... Uh, they're, they're selling the idea of utter conformity because it looks weird when you color your hair blue and claim that you're non-binary, that you're non-conforming to something. No, all the kids are doing it. They're conforming to their social uh, milieu. They're, they're not non-conforming. They're conforming to the regime. It's the most disgusting thing we've all seen. It's like, why are, where are the rebels? Where are the kids going against any of this? Well, they're all scared and they're all locked into their devices. That's where they are. Sorry if you're one of those kids, but that's what they've done to you. You're missing all of life. You're not rebelling for sure because, oh my God, you might get canceled or that might be weird or it might be uncomfortable or something. 1.3.5, context of COVID-19. What would this document be without invoking COVID? Who knows? How could you possibly do that? It was a narrow window of opportunity. Remember when Klaus Schwab said that repeatedly in the Great Reset stuff that people said was a conspiracy theory, literally, even though he kept saying it? Higher education institutions all over the world have risen to the COVID-19 challenge. They've done a great job, guys, by generously contributing their scientific knowledge and resources, like wearing fucking masks all the time. It's very scientifical. Like social distancing. That was real. Like whatever the CCP-owned T.H. Chan School of Public Health at Harvard said, very scientific. Maybe like University College London, which put out the model that was so dead wrong about COVID that we all destroyed our economies over it. Thank you for contributing generously your scientific knowledge and resources to help in the fight against the pandemic. You guys, thank you so damn much. Thank you for everything you did at the universities, like not allowing studies on, not allowed to say ivermectin on the air, to be published. For saying that you have no idea why people are having these problems after they get the, you're not allowed to say vaccine on the air. Thank you so much for your freaking contributions, for suppressing for um, channeling an agenda, for creating and promulgating models, for putting your professors on social media and on television to run their mouths and to be completely dead wrong about every freaking bit of it with gigantic, enormous consequences that you, of all people, felt the least in the world. Thank you so much for your generous contributions and scientific knowledge and resources to help in the fight against the pandemic. Y'all in the higher education institutions did a bang up job with COVID. Thank you. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. Within a few weeks after the onslaught of the deadly virus, not that deadly guys, universities developed a faster and cheaper COVID-19 test in places as diverse as Colombia, the United Kingdom, and Vietnam. Okay, a faster and cheaper COVID-19 test, which was super accurate and had made it so we all tested everybody all the time and then everybody thought there was tons of COVID when... Okay. Laboratories within universities have produced medical supplies, sanitizing equipment. Yeah, so did liquor stores. So did, like, distilleries. And it turned out that surfaces didn't need to be sanitized. So, eh, it didn't need it. Oh, it didn't really do anything. It's too bad you're like a scientific institution and could have like known that that's not how it transmits, right? No, no. But your scientific knowledge and resources, no? Oh. Laboratories within universities have produced medical supplies, sanitizing equipment, medicines, like, never mind. And ventilators, oof. In sub-Saharan Africa, several universities have been at the forefront of epidemiological research and communication to the public on COVID on the COVID-19 crisis, notably in Ghana and Nigeria, working very diligently to suppress the fact of the one you can't talk about. Ta-da! Rhymes with horse paste. Before the February 20, uh, sorry, before the February 2021 coup, two universities in Myanmar, 
Yangon Technological University, and Mandalay Technological University designed robots that can transport food, medicine, and trash at hospitals and thereby reduce the need for person-to-person contact. Cool. The response of higher education institutions to the current crisis illustrates the importance of their role in generating knowledge in sustainable technological applications that contribute to solving both global and local problems and leading humanity in progressing towards sustainable development goals. Now, hold on. You're telling me that the universities can contribute scientifically to doing as well on the sustainable development goals for the planet as they did with COVID-19? That's all I needed to hear. That's all I needed to hear. You know, the response is, it illustrates their importance in generating knowledge and sustainable something to solve the problems like COVID-19 and probably the sustainable development goals. It's all I needed to hear. They're going to do equally well on COVID-19 and the sustainable development goals for the world around them. Look how well they did with COVID-19. They just said so in the previous paragraph. The strong contribution that research universities can make is conditional upon governments recognizing and respecting their key scientific role. In a recent letter to African ministers of higher education, the General Secretary of the Association of African Universities urged African governments to use the pandemic as an opportunity, quote, to strengthen our educational institutions and systems by making them future ready and able to survive and thrive in a world of uncertainty. Hmm. Great. By contrast, in Brazil, several universities stepped in to provide health health advice to the population. I hope it was better than what we got here in the U.S. I just hope it was. In the absence of evidence-based policy guidance at the highest levels of the federal government, in the United States of America, USA, it is tragically ironic to observe a disconnect between scientific evidence and policy action regarding COVID-19. No shit, it really is. How about that? in the nation with the greatest number of Nobel Prize winners for medicine in the past century. In the U.S., it's tragically ironic to observe a disconnect between scientific evidence and policy action regarding COVID-19. Yes, true. Yes, definitely true. Definitely tragic. May have killed 92% of the people that died of it. Huh. Somehow I think they mean something different than what I'm thinking. Somehow. Section 1.4, on the nature of this report. Remember, this chapter was actually an introduction. This report is the outcome of a one-year collaboration process of a global independent expert group set up by UNESCO in partnership with the University of Bergen and supported by the International Science Council and the International Association of Universities, which is probably a bunch of corrupt organizations. The mandate of this group is in, of internationally renowned asshole uh, experts was to reflect on and communicate the transformations, the red thread, transformation is a red thread, okay, needed in the higher education institutions in order to be able to effectively commit and contribute to the 2030 agenda and the sustainable development goals. I mean, you might want to do something else, but that's what this is about. It is meant to inform and inspire discussions, right, compliance, and agreements, oh, there's compliance, in the context of the Third World Higher Education Conference. Now, that's third as in it's the third time it happened, not third as in third world, to be held in Barcelona in 2022 and to continue these global conversations even beyond that. It is worth mentioning that due to the pandemic, all the group meetings have been digital. <laughs> Because of the science, guys. Because, you know, the science, the science, the scientific knowledge that they have in all the universities where they're really good about the COVID. They, like, so they, they had all digital meetings because of the science, because of the pandemic on the science. They had only digital meetings for the entirety of this whole task force that's going to set sustainable development policy for the whole friggin' world. Because of the science, guys, the science, it's all been digital. And this has clearly posed some challenges. Yeah, because it sucks. Nevertheless, the fact that in the entire report has been written without physical meetings and flights is in itself is in itself an interesting example of the potential for this kind of sustainable international digital cooperation. The global independent expert group that authors this report is composed of 14 members from the this is boring no one cares where they're from who they are. The contribution of the higher education institutes is manifold, blah, blah, blah. This is actually not important. This was a part I wanted to skip. 
but it says the same stuff. As we've mentioned, its frame of reference is a human rights-based approach and the aspiration of leaving no one behind, which is the overall purpose of the 2030 agenda, except the deplorables and the people who are starving to death in Sri Lanka. It believes that the Sustainable Development Goals define some of the most important purposes to be achieved in order to reach this consensus, like I guess they're going to find out about in the winter in Germany and Britain, the institutions and organizations of nations and societies are called upon to work toward these goals. Higher education institutions are key to fostering progress toward them. Do we really want to read the details of the structure of the report? Eh, not really. Uh, I don't think there's anything that like jumps out as important. Um, we're going to separately in the report, first, the role of inter- and transdisciplinary disciplinarity for curriculum development and research programs, that's chapter two, emphasizing especially the relationship between the humanities and the social sciences on the one hand and the natural sciences on the other. See, when they say inter and transdisciplinarity, what they mean is we're going to put social scientists and humanities scholars into the hard sciences. Okay, that's what it means. And engineering and stuff. Second, how to build on and promote knowledge that comprises a diverse range of traditions, institutions, and epistemologies. So we're going to have a different ways of knowing. Those are ways of knowing. To promote a truly global knowledge base for the sustainable development goals. Because just like in the feminist glaciology project, you have to pay attention to feminist knowledges and you have to pay attention to indigenous knowledges about glaciers or else you can't understand that some glaciers are male and some glaciers are female and that glaciers have sex and that glaciers are influenced by the smell of fat burning too close to them. And that you can actually inspire people to care about glaciers by doing feminist-based art projects of them. And that the science of glaciology would be improved, not just by looking at satellite photos of glaciers and how they spread across, say, mountaintops or different terrains, but also including paintings done by feminist women of similar things. That's all really in the paper. Because you have to include different epistemologies to promote a truly global knowledge base for sustainable development goals. And third, the question of how to strengthen the role of higher education institutions. No nuclear power. Feminist glaciology, yes. Nuclear power, no. Just to be clear. And third, the question of how to strengthen the role of higher education institutions as partners with both private, public, and civil society actors. With both, both private, public, and civil. Both. Both of the three private, public, and civil society actors in the work with the Sustainable Development Goals. Due with the work, due to the different levels of abstraction of these core issues, they have been approached with moderately different tones in the relevant sections. Furthermore, the types of conclusions drawn and recommendations provide a different style, blah, 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 no one cares. Then we recognize that there's lots of people that are involved in this. The purpose of these boxes is not to suggest that they include example boxes that I'll mostly skip. And they're explaining why anybody who feels excluded has to understand that they couldn't put all of them in there. It's kind of funny. Beyond disciplinary boundaries for the sustainable development goals, the first theme on working together with the sustainable development goals addresses the questions of moving toward more inter- and transdisciplinary approaches to education and research. It problematizes, does it really? It problematizes the knowledge accumulation logic followed by many higher education institutions when this leads to overemphasizing theoretical aspects and downplaying practical issues and real-world problems, which are precisely those that the sustainable development goals aim to address. I would assume, like feminist glaciology. It makes the case for including more problem-based learning and research in the higher education institutions' programs and activities. The report proposes that sustainable development goals should not be mere add-ons to the classic curricula, but embedded as a premise for all education and research. Remember you guys that you weren't going to have to change very much? No, sustainable development goals should not be mere add-ons to the classic curricula, but should be embedded as a premise for all education and research in all higher education institutions. While reward systems and university rankings promote competition and select for high productivity, citations, and visibility, higher education institutions should rather be scored and then also rated according to their performance on the su sustainable development goals. Sounds like communism. Similarly, selection criteria for position, position, positions, goodness, selection criteria for positions should also consider merits related to sustainable development goals and societal interactions. See, you've got to be woke and on the sustainable agenda if you want to get a job in a college. A key challenge in doing so is how to promote inter- and transdisciplinarity. Of course, how do you get more humanities scholars working into everything? which implies gradually giving way to inter- and transdisciplinary approaches to knowledge. 
which means that the humanities scholars are going to correct your science. Complex problems like the ones like the uh, sustainable development goals address require explanations and later solutions that demand the convergence of multiple disciplines working together, interdisciplinarily and transdisciplinarily. Sustainability is perhaps the best example of a new science, or a new, new, sustain, a new sensibility maybe. Uh, sustainability is perhaps the best example of a new science where disciplines converge to both understand and to try to face and solve the complex problems that unsustainable production and consumption create. You know, the things Karl Marx was cared, uh, cared about. So we have a new Wissenschaft, Liter Socialismus. Uh, we have a new science, Wissenschaft, where disciplines converge to understand the world and to change it. Hmm. Engaging in other ways of knowing. That's going to be chapter three, by the way. The second theme relates to engaging in other ways of knowing. The report makes a strong case for the need for higher education institutions in general to open up to multiple and plural views of the world, like feminist glaciology, as well as to very diverse ways of knowing, like human reactions to rape culture and queer performativity in dog parks in Portland, Oregon that can add value to strict science-based knowledge. Let me just not add my little add-ons there and say that again. The report makes a strong case for the needs for higher education institutions in general to open up to multiple and plural views of the world as well as to very diverse, very diverse ways of knowing that can add value to strict science-based knowledge. Mm. And with a potential for, among other things, explaining and protecting the environment specifically, of course. Higher education institutions should be privileged spaces for epistemological dialogues among diverse views of the world and should, op should show openness to diverse ways of knowing. Great. You know what that means. You know now that that's just Freire's call to bring in marginalized knowledges, to decolonize the curriculum. It's just Marxism. It's really to bring in Marxists and Marxist views. And make sure as a humanities scholar who's steeped in Marxism that's going to tell you when your science meets with what the Soviet, I mean, the, the, the Council of Stakeholders says that it's going to be. In, it has to be sustainable or it's not going to be allowed. It's going to be refused. They've said this repeatedly. In this section, the report argues in favor of making the most of the learning potential in the process of implementing change where learning can be enhanced when accompanied by research objectives like action research and when social participants are included in the definition of the need for change and in the research that goes with it, participatory research. In other words, we're going to mix activism and research. Experimental and quasi-experimental interventions have the advantage of allowing for the testing of causal hypotheses that may make way for scaling successful local developments and influencing public policy. You're going to be lobbyists. We propose that uh, the social robustness of solutions developed by higher education institutions in general be the measure of quality. Epistemological issues also need revising. Knowledge produced in a diverse way. Whoops, I scrolled down with the wrong button. One second. Where were we here? Went one too far. My apologies. Epistemological issues are also need revising. Knowledge produced in a diverse range of settings can provide important insights for solving environmental health production and social problems locally. And some of this knowledge has been successfully transferred into other contexts and, have, and been found to have more universal uses. This is why traditional downplaying, ignoring, and discrimination against more diverse ways of knowing should be openly combated, and conversely, higher education institutions should set an example of openness to other non-hegemonic modes of knowledge production. Yeah. They should also foster epistemological dialogue as a means toward renewing our questions and finding new ways of seeking answers. I know this is getting long, but let me make the point. This is what Paulo Freire did. He created a Marxist theory of knowledge and knowing, and therefore there's accepted knowledge, which is bourgeois knowledge, and then there's marginalized knowledge. And what you have to do is bring marginalized knowledge in in order, and marginalized knowledge is going to carry with it marginalized people, but the only people who authentically express marginalized knowledge and understand it correctly enough to be experts in it and the marginalization are going to be critically conscious Marxists. That's all this means. 
That's all this means to non-hegemonic modes of knowledge production. So we have really great modes of knowledge production that have been refined over centuries. They're extremely good at finding decent answers to questions about the world. And what they're saying is that we have to water that down because that's just hegemony. They're not really right answers about the world. They're just what certain people benefit from pretending are right answers to the world. They're hegemonic and they exclude other ways of knowing. They marginalize it. So we have to bring in the wrong, the crazy, the ridiculous, the superstitious. You're not allowed to say superstitious anymore. That's a non-inclusive word, by the way. And include that among our other knowledges. And of course, what that means is you have to bring in the people who believe those things, crazy people, you know, shamans, etc. You're not allowed to say shamans or witchcraft or any of this stuff. You're not allowed to say this stuff, but that's what it means. Like queer theorists are just fucking crazy people. You have to let them in and they're going to let them retool early childhood development psychology so that they can retool early childhood education so that they can go pedo on kids. I don't know what else to tell you. Or so they, if they don't go pedo on them, so they can utterly destroy their sense of, of, of uh, category formation through radical gender theory and uh, queer theory. And so they can't figure out what a fucking girl is and they don't know who they are and they grow up confused with personality disorders and, and they get double mastectomies at 12 years old or whatever. Great freaking plan, guys. Great plan. That's what you guys have to do to be sustainable. Higher education institutions. Higher education partnerships, that's chapter four, which I think is super boring and super weird, which we probably won't read. The third theme deals with the need for a more proactive presence of higher education institutions in general in society and in each of its different sectors, the government, the private sector, civil society, and the social organizations and communities that represent the very diverse sectors of every society and that to different degrees suffer the consequences of inequality and environmental deterioration. Higher education institutions in general have a strong standing in society, not for long, and are trusted, not so much anymore. However, it is not often that higher education institutions take advantage of this fact to expand their relationships with the different sectors of societies, attend to their educational needs, and learn from their problems and difficulties, as well as from their worldviews. You had better adopt the Marxist worldview. Higher education institutes must build alliances with governments, private enterprises, civil society, organizations, and local communities, but never at the cost of putting societies, a society or sectors thereof at risk. Higher education institutes generate knowledge and train professionals, but there's lots of knowledges, right? But not all of them base their research and curricular design on the evolving needs of the societies around them. In response to the call to contribute to the uh, sustainable development goals, higher education institutions must play a much more dominant role in society as a whole and in the different sectors that compose it. Knowledge and science should be democratized. Whatever way of knowing, it's science. And higher education institutions have an accepted role to play in this process. However, some of the knowledge generated and much of the education students receive in higher education institutions can be translated into politics and intervention projects that involve solutions to problems or potential improvements to well-being and social justice. So you've got to become social justice activists. This involves strengthening the outreach that higher education institutions already do and directing it towards advocacy for change and transformation, Marxism, and toward social impact, Marxism. Higher education institutions have an important role to play in decision-making and a commitment to having a place and voice in government and society in congruence with their ethical principles, which of course they said have to be sustainable development goals. Because they occupy the highest rank in the educational system hierarchy, higher education institutions can, in general can play a key role in democratizing quality education for all. Education for all, by the way, here is capitalized, which is a proper noun, which means it's a brand name, as well as in educating society regarding sustainability and sustainable development goals. Education for all, I think, is another UNESCO program, but I can't remember for sure what it is. I, sh I assure you that it is communist education garbage but as well as in educating society regarding sustainability and the sustainable development goals. So you guys have to be evangelists for the new religion of sustainable development goals. 
we are aware of the diversity of higher education institutions in general. Yeah, this is this acknowledgement. I think there was actually a footnote earlier that I skipped to, as well as the diversity of contexts in which they are located, and freely admit that this report will not be able to do this incredible diversity justice. Each higher education institute must find its own way of responding to this call. We do not mean to dictate solutions, but open up areas for debate and guide decision making. They didn't add, so long as you're committed to the sustainable development goals. We are convinced that higher education institutions must do this together with governments, civil society, the private sector, and those who suffer most from the problems of our world today. In other words, in solidarity with the oppressed, just like Paulo Freire said. In other words, from the standpoint of the people, as they called it in Maoist China or Leninist Russia or USSR. So the strange death of the university is unfolding before our eyes as we read through this, summarize and close up. What we're reading about here is the unbridled call that when Herbert Marcuse said in 1969 in his essay on liberation, that there was a need for a new sensibility that would describe a new rationality for a new reality, a new sensibility that would be the, the new values that everybody would just assume this is what's sensible, this is what it is. When he said that there was going to be a need for a new sensibility in order to achieve liberated socialism, what they have done is found that new sensibility and sustainability. What this document is gearing to do is to make that the prevailing sensibility of higher education institutions. The goal is to retool the universities, again, in line with exactly the kind of warning we could derive from John Henry Newman, to bind together the fields of the universities and orient them toward this new sensibility of sustainability, the tyranny of the 21st century, which is going to be orchestrated and perpetrated upon us by the United Nations, which it would be wonderful we could believe has our best interests in mind, but it's so heavily Marxist, inciting actual Marxists and mirroring and echoing Marxist language that we have to be extremely suspicious of that. Be and also, you may have heard me mention the, the lack of mentioning nuclear power here, and then the one time a nuclear word gets used, the fusion of the atom, it seems to be that they use the wrong word and don't even know what they're talking about probably because they were doing transdisciplinarity and as a humanities person writing about nuclear energy. But never mind, that's the future of higher education institutions, and that's what we're going to learn in chapter two of this in the next installment of The Strange Death of the University. So I hope that you are understanding what's happening. Let me make it, make it real simple and we'll stop. Sustainability is the heart of this new religion, sustainable and inclusive future. That's what Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum always say, a sustainable and inclusive future. Sustainability is the new sensibility at the heart of this new religion that the universities are being asked to turn into its cathedrals. They're being asked to transform. You don't have to change any of your values. You just be explicit about them, and they happen to have to be this. You're not going to lose your academic freedom. You're just going to have to favor this kind of research and never do that kind of research. But that's not a loss of freedom because everybody's more free if we don't have sustainable sustainability problems. Just like Rousseau said, we're all more free if we give up some of our freedoms because our new social contract that you're going to have to help to write, which is the glue of society held together by its broad civic religion, which is going to be sustainability, is going to tell us that that's how we have to be. Do you understand yet? Do you understand yet? What's going on? So the university, I'm telling you, last time I'm going to say it, this is the last stop of the train. The train goes off a cliff. This is the last station. If you are a university, a university administrator, somebody with power over those, somebody who cares about them, this is the last station. If you continue from this station, following this track, the universities are going to die. They will not be recoverable. They are going to die. You are becoming the instruments of a totalitarian project. You will not survive this process. Harvard University, you will not survive this process. You will all become jokes. This is the last station. Get off the train. Get off the train and start going back to the missions that the universities were set up to do, which is basic research, education at a higher level, to 
train not lifelong learners, but mature adults who are ready to go out and be successful professionals in the existing society, to make the world actually better for living in it, rather than to envision a utopian transformation that runs as a red thread through all of the sustainable development goals that if you continue on this track, you have to commit to and reorient your organizations and institutions around. That's what's happening. That's the stakes. Get off the train. <laughs>